Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to San Francisco Public Library. I'm Michelle Jeffers. Um, first of all, you may have been asked, and you may see this flyer in the back of the room. It's for the Arts Commission survey, and I encourage you, all of you lovers of art and music and literature, to please take this survey. Thank you. Um, again, I want to thank everyone for making it out here today for our beautiful Sunday afternoon and for going, I know, a 49ers sport football thing today, um, for the celebration of Booksmith's new book, Sunday Matinee. Um, before we start, let me get, begin with a land acknowledgement. San Francisco Public Library acknowledges that we occupy the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramitush Ohlone people. We recognize that we benefit from living and working on this land, and as uninvited guests, we affirm the Ramitush Ohlone sovereign rights, and we wish to pay our respect to their ancestors, elders, relatives, and community. Thank you. Now on with our show. Our speakers today probably need no introduction to this crowd here, but I'll, I'll be brief anyway. Brooke Smith, of course, is an acclaimed actor and photographer. Sunday Matinee gathers together her extensive photo document, documentation in which she spent years capturing the epic New York hardcore scene of the 1980s. The bands that played CBGBs, Sunday afternoon gigs, as well as the young people who followed them and hung out in Manhattan's Lower East Side. She'll be in conversation with author Laura Albert, who's an internationally recognized writer for her J.T. Leroy books, Sarah, The Heart is Deceitful Among All Things, and Harold's End. She also spent a good deal of her adolescence in the 70s and 80s immersed in the punk and hardcore scenes, distributing records, creating art, interviewing musicians, writing for zines, and amassing a legendary collection of flyers. Um, I want to also give a special shout out to our friends in the back of the room, our bookstore partners, Folio Books of Noe Valley. They'll be selling books all day today, and the authors will be signing them afterwards, so please patronize them if you can. After Laura and Brooke's conversation, we will take questions from the audience here in person and chatted in questions on Zoom. If you're here in person, we are recording this talk for later, so I want to make sure that you don't ask your question until there is a microphone in front of your mouth. Thank you for that. Now, please join me in, in welcoming them to the stage to the accompaniment of our own San Francisco and San Francisco Public Library's own Penelope Houston and the Avengers, American and Me. Thank you. <laughs> That's her. Thank you so much for coming today. Yeah, thanks, guys. Yeah, yeah no, come on. It's a nice day out there. Woo. Thank you. Thank you. I am Lucha Alba, and this is Brooke, Brooke Schmidt. Hello, everyone. <laughs> yeah, and... Uh, Thank you again so much. That and that song that was the Avengers. That was Penelope, who also it she worked at the San Francisco Public Library, and we would like to thank the San Francisco Public Library for their really beautiful hard work uh, in having us both here. And yeah, thank thanks, you. guys. Yeah, pretty rad. So a lot of thanks. A lot of thank yous. I am going to open by setting the scene so we can talk about what we talk about when we're talking about the New York City hardcore scene, because it was a very specific niche. And this is, so what years are we talking about? It's 82? Yeah, like 82, 83, that was the beginning. I mean, I was like 13, 14? So yeah, when you when you got into yeah. the hardcore, yeah, yeah, I mean, I I got into punk and then and then that was around seventy nine. Anyway, 
<clears throat> it's, it, this is hard. The hard part is is not getting all fetishistic about it. You know, I've seen a lot of interviews, and it's like, ah, oh, dude, look, there's John, man, and I know that guy. And he's like, oh, what happened to the band? It's, it is really, really hard. So if you're into that shit, I'm going to try not to do that, save it for your fucking questions, but I'll end up doing that. Okay, what I'm going to read to you is, let's see, when did I write this? That's not here. Nicole, what was the date on it? Oh, it's right there. So, the, like, like the woman said, oh, I'm the clicker. Fuck me too, God. <laughs> All right, here it is. So, as you can see, New York. Rockers, I wrote this, I'm 16 years old, and it was published, and I was so fucking happy. I wrote a letter in to New York Rockers to set them straight about the New York City hardcore punk scene. Okay, now you got, I, I have to give myself some credit for reading this to you guys. As you can see, it says, je accuse, accuse. Let me say it. I had no idea what the fuck that meant, and it had to be explained to me. Dear New York Rocker, there has been a lot of excitement lately about the New York hardcore scene finally getting off the ground. Bands are popping out from nowhere. More straight-laced clubs are chancing hardcore nights. Kids are piecing together fanzines, and there's even hardcore radio. A half hour better than nothing. There is, this is all wonderful, but there are lots of signs of it souring. What was the original idea anyway? Wasn't it to not to conform to society's dictates? To fight the government running our lives? To get rid of the hierarchy of the rock scene? To be original? To relieve boredom and express feelings with loud, hard, fast music? That's still my goals, right? What I see at clubs is the, quote, smash your face, end quote, attitude of punks looking for fights. Isn't that pure stupidity? Putting their energies into fighting other punks when the government is so much more deserving? I see more bands supporting this type of thing. Then they'll complain when their sets are ruined by fights. I want to be able to go to a club and enjoy a band, dancing until I'm sick, without fear of some skin deciding the earth is better off without me. Reagan has done a lot for the hardcore scene, giving us a hell of a lot more subjects to sing about. Sing about it, fight, and be original. I'm sure there are punks out there who have more than a one-word vocabulary. Anarchy! Yeah, you can get away with a lead singer who screams about death and makes an attempt at black flag. A7 will show you, but isn't that boring? Now, I'm not saying you synthesizers. I'm 16, okay? Not like, like, it was like I was maybe, anyway. Some poke, some poke, some punks are even turning it into a cult. The straight edge skin laws of don't smoke, drink, or fuck, and obviously don't have fun. <laughs> It's so cringe. Okay. And the, oh no, it gets better. And are these the people you'd like to spend your evenings with? <laughs> oh my God. The New York scene has plenty of bands. Unfortunately, oh wait, this is great. The New York scene has plenty of bands. Unfortunately, only a few stand out. The nihilistics are great, if only because they're sincere in their pessimism. <laughs> The newest band around that's getting there is Killer Instinct. This is by no means due to their lead singer. Fortunately, the band drowns her out. <laughs> I didn't care about getting my ass kicked. New York is also home to even worse Bad Brains, The Undead, and The Misfits. The band that most prominently stands out with high-powered energy and great songs is Kraut. Fast, fast side guy from the lead, this lead singer from Kraut, he told me a joke. Uh, he said, what do you call a, a bull masturbating? I don't know. What do you call a bull masturbating? Beef stroganoff. <laughs> I still fucking remember a dog from Kraut. 
our neighbor scene of Washington, D.C. can claim a number of good bands. Minor Threat, with its hard, fast, fast sound, is pulling out ahead of the lot. Word association with California brings to mind mohawk skins, black flags, surfing, and bodybuilding. True, but that's changing. More bands are thinking for themselves instead of trying to copy the Circle Jerks, Dead Kennedys, and TSOL. Bad Religion is a great example. They're different. The lyrics talk about what's going on. The music is wonderful, and they're full of energy. Social unrest and wasted youth are also fast and fun. <laughs> I'm, I'm, okay, this is, this is 16 year, what? I'm 16, 16 year old Laura's gonna tell you here. Okay, 16 year old Laura wants to tell you, I'm basically optimistic about hardcore punk. I hope that punks will remember what it was originally about. Do you remember? We're gonna find out. I, okay, and now my recommendations. I recommend you be original. <laughs> Direct your anger at the things that should be focused on. The Republicans, e.g. the government, and have fun. Laura Albert, Brooklyn, New York, July 1982. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if they took my advice. It sounds like you were ahead of your time. <laughs> yeah, Let's play here. Okay. So. Let's see what we got. Okay. This is... I wanted, We want to talk about the, the... One thing about the scene was the D... I, DIY, DYI. Do it yourself Self. of it all. Yeah. Yeah. And these are badges. Okay, take a look. Well, first, I. Did you make all of these? I did in a mental hospital. <laughs> That's good. Uh, you'd get badges, and they had a badge making machine and copy flyers. And this is, this is what I did in occupational therapy. And uh, this was 17-year-old Laura. And this is the stuff you'd walk around. And we'd sell them at uh, CBGB's. And look at that one, blue by day, white by night. That's um, millions of dead cops. <laughs> so imagine you'd wear that. And it didn't take much. And you'd get canal jeans. Did you guys do that, the canal jeans? I mean, I, we didn't make pins like that, no. It's covered in whiteout. This is, this is just really setting the scene before we get into This is like the... the you didn't think about licensing agreements. These are my artwork again for a uh, mental institution. Uh, these are wristbands and sold at CBGB's. <laughs> these are Brooks flyers. Why don't you take us through? Oh yeah, this one's a little out of focus, but uh, yeah, these are just, I just put a bunch of flyers together to show, yeah, set the scene as you said. Um. Now, now let's talk about the New York City. I like that one, the Murphy's Law one on the left. That. <laughs> oh my God! I didn't even catch that. With Who the made wild, that? The one? wild thing tattoo inside the lips there. Wow. Uh huh. And there, the cop at the and and these were just placed, you know, for everyone to see, including. Yeah. A lot of girl bands I have flyers for here, which there weren't that many, really. It's beautiful. Bring me, it said. <laughs> oh, that was my, one of mine there. You made the, that one? No, go back or whatever. Back? Forward? I don't know. Forward? Back? No. Keep going. Keep going. Wait, forward? Yeah. Keep going. More. There, on the far left. Which we left. I mean, I guess it all, that one, you know, okay. psychos, ultraviolence, that's a photo of mine. Oh, and there's underdog. Oh, God, it's hard. Okay, we're going to, okay, get into yeah. some questions We're not going to be nostalgic, remember? Yeah, yeah well, well, let's get into your, into your, we're, that's Brock. How old are you there? Tell us about that picture. I mean, I don't know. I don't know, am I 15, 16? Something like that. We had a crimper. <laughs> It's natural. I think that should come back. Do people crimp anymore? 
No? It's probably not good for your hair. I once dyed my hair so many times, and my mom said, if you keep dyeing your hair, it's going to fall out. And uh, it did. <laughs> and so then I had to shave it because she couldn't be right. My mom told me if you keep doing that, it's going to stay that way. Like you could actually train your hair to do, to get a color, especially when dying. Never mind. Okay. <clears throat> So, Brooke, yes. yes, now that we're here, let's, let's get into our questions. Okay, so, I mean, the, the thing is, when, when, I, when I look at those pictures and knowing what I know, I used to, hey, um, I, I talked to, um, I knew there were pay phones, so that we had pay phones back then, and we had the phone numbers outside A7 and at key places, and when you would call, people would be hanging out and someone would answer. And it was a way to become friends with people. And there wasn't, it was very easy to access people. And um, when I look at those pictures, I see enacted what they were telling me about, which was the trauma, the absolute horror of living at home and having been physically and sexually abused and having no way to talk about that. And now so many of our peers who um, are, some of them still performing, are just starting. So you're finding people who are in their 50s, um, older, starting to talk about that. What was your sense of that at the time? It's, yeah, uh, we never talked about it. <laughs> we didn't talk about it. Um, I was just texting the other day with a guy that I used to date back then, and and I asked him, because I know uh, he was sexually abused, and I said, did we talk about it back then? Because how did I know about you? But it wasn't until later, 20s maybe. I guess there were, no one talked about it back then, did they? I mean, not in my experience. Well, you have to remember... <clears throat> in the DSM, PTSD as related to a non-combatant didn't enter into the DSM, which is the medical diagnostic uh, book. I'm going to fuck this up, but you basically get the idea. I was in foster care when it just started, when they just started thinking that a non-combatant could suffer from PTSD. And there really wasn't the language. There was a few after-school specials, but it was it was just not there. And there was the idea that um, uh, the the family was still well. Well, you had Reagan talking about the family and the importance of family, and Anita Bryant, and so. But yet, I would say that our common denominator. I think it's really interesting that we all put ourselves in uh, dangerous, physical, intimate experiences, you know, but the difference being that we put ourselves there, you know, and it was kind of like, and we all knew each other, so we could learn to trust each other, you know, we could learn to trust, uh, which was not something we knew about. So, I don't know, I've just been thinking about that lately. What's interesting is if the, the lyrics, if you look back and read them, it's kind of available in a very kind of shadowy, um, oblique way. You can take it as metaphor, metaphor, the feeling of being unsafe, attacked. And but at the time, it's like, like telling a deeper truth. You know, it's almost like we both worked with David Milch um, from Deadwood NYPD Blue. And one of uh, his, uh, he would talk about a lie agreed upon. Right, yeah. Do you want to explain like what? Well, I don't know if I can explain that. You should try to explain that. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Fuck you then. Okay. <laughs> um, a lie to agree upon. It's, it's like where a lie, that it's a silence, like um, that we're, we're hard, we're strong, we're badasses. And the lie agreed upon is that we're really terrified and we, no place is safe for us, yeah. that we're not okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was 220 pounds. I, I was like, do not come near me. 
don't come near me. Yeah. And okay, so that that's a whole other that's a whole other um, issue because you and I both shared that. Um, it's funny. Hillary Mantel talked about that there are no fat saints, and I I've said like there were no fat punks. You know, there was for a female. It was very much like it was like fascist pig, and the idea of being an overweight girl. I remember there were some big guys. But to be a girl, the, it was like they had recreated or we recreated the structure and what was allowed. How do you feel? Well, let's get back to your camera and then we'll jump back to the, the issues of our bodies. Mm -hmm. You started taking these pictures. You immersed yourself in the scene. How did that happen? Well, I wanted to be a performer, but I was too scared. And I was too, you know, self conscious to, you know, I just didn't want anybody to look at me, so it's not a great quality for a performer. Um, and the scene, there was no separation between the bands and the audience, so in a way it was like, you know, helping me get there, you know? Um, wait, what was your question? The, how you got in there, so, I mean, you you had a camera right away. Yeah, and, and it was the only class I liked in high school, photography, so... Um, and it was my way of getting right up into the center of the action, but still being hidden. So, yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's interesting in the sense that you're, but we'll talk about how you got into that, that scene right away, like how you, because it's so intimidating. I mean, everyone would be hanging out outside and we've got to show you the, the street. And P.S., we didn't know each other back then, yeah. you know? Um, I lived in Rockland County. I had to take the bus in in the beginning, and then I had my parents' old green station wagon. Um, How did you process going back and forth between, like, school? Because you, you, you stayed in school. Yeah, and I don't know how I graduated either. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know how I... I just wanted to be in the city. I just wanted to be in the city. So the day that I graduated high school, I moved in. And by then I was already, you know, I'd gone to a million matinees and I knew everybody and, you know, so I, I just had to get there. I couldn't be back in my house or in my hometown, you know. I'm, I'm always struck by, and it's not just me and this scene and anything. Like when you see a photograph of somebody, there's a photo of me in the end of this batch of photos where you just go like, how did you walk down the street and no one stopped you and said like, are you okay? I yeah, mean, no, genuinely. They would, they would get frightened, but that's kind of what we were after. Yeah. There was this definite feeling of, of wanting a reaction and wanting to declare your independence and that it, it was calling out the structures that were supposed to protect us, the institutions that had failed us and saying, fuck you, we know you're full of shit, you did not protect us and we reject all of you and we're going to put it in your face. I mean, all of us would be canceled because there was such a rebellion against, we had felt, we felt so deeply betrayed because again, the physical violence that people survived, the sexual violence, the emotional violence was so severe and there really wasn't, there, it was rare for people to get help and, and what was offered was so fucked up that it was just a complete, um, life was better on the street and so many of us were on the street and living on the street. And uh, we should get to some of the, um, so this was, this is Tompkins Square Park, yeah. right? Yeah. So this was the gathering. This was kind of like the gauntlet. And What's everyone. so funny is the person, I don't remember his name in the middle, but the guy in the blue shirt sitting there, he mm -hmm. was homeless, a guy named Gary. And I remember him so well. We would have bonfires, you know, those old garbage cans, mm -hmm. uh, you know, at night in the park and listen to them talk. And they, a lot of those people who back then we called them bums, mm -hmm. remember? Instead Oy of... They, um, they would talk about how they had been, you know, they'd served in the army or whatever and now here they were, you know? Um, so, 
Anyway, I just think it's interesting. I remember Gary so well on the left there. Um, yeah, it's Tompkins. Yep. So uh, what what what's different about the New York City hardcore scene as opposed to the broader punk scene? Um, I mean, there were a lot of like interscene wars, and what's interesting was the the drug, the drug and alcohol use, and. I mean, you had uh, DC and Boston more accepted, uh, went along with kind of straight edge. Um, and, but the New York hardcore scene was very, very specific. And it was quite, it was quite, it was a mix. It was quite a mix of all kinds of different backgrounds. But yet, it very much had that kind of, um, I guess you would, you would prime it like a, a lot of, uh, QAnon type people, you would say today. Extremist. You, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Even though they were all from backgrounds that would be the first to be uh, attacked. Mm -hmm. What? But what are your thoughts of why the New York scene, like Angel Dust, was like a, a requisite? Like you went out and sought out Angel Dust. I didn't. I mean, I embraced. I ended up embracing uh, Straight Edge. Yeah, I I went the other way. What, so what? I mean, we were, you know, kids, and we were messed up, and we just took a lot of drugs and ran around town. I lost all that weight, and people would say, "How'd you do it?" And I was like, "I'm a vegetarian." <laughs> I Harry forgot Krishna. I was taking speed every single day for like a year. So you know, yeah, just clueless, you know. And, and there were people who tried to find a help, a spiritual help, and the best was Hare Krishna. But skinhead style. So you would have, I remember there was Harley and, and, and John. John from the Cro-Mags, yeah. And, but they brought us free food. There was free food in the park. So. But they would have a circle during Hare Krishna, Krishna, and they would start slam dancing. <laughs> it would turn into a skank but Was dance. that anywhere else? That wasn't just New York, right? That was New York. Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> That was definitely Because for me, I remember we just had to be the hardest because we were in New York. We had to be the toughest. There were always fights with um, Boston. Yes. You know, those bands would come into town. The FU, social SSD control. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and there were battles. I mean, it was, and, and that's how the trauma expressed itself. That's the rage that came out. And the sweetest guys, sweetest guys when you would talk to them and, Really, like, gentlemen. And also because the hood itself was pretty wild. And uh, I always felt safer if I was <laughs> with John and Harley, you know? I mean, you know, I always felt safer to be with those guys. Because they would fight. And this was, this was Alphabet City when most of it was just burnt down. There were a ton of squats, a ton of abandoned buildings. There weren't, there, were, there was some outreach, but it wasn't like it was now. And there wasn't a lot of available care for kids. And um, when, so you talk about not feeling safe in your body, and you've talked about some of why that was. It, it strikes me that having that camera offered you this protection right away. Like a, it was um, a way to be there being both, um, the focus isn't on you. And... I mean, it's almost like an instrument, too, because I could also feel like, oh, I'm doing this for the band. You know, I have a reason, a purpose to be here. Like, like being an actor, you found... Yeah. Wait, how is that like being an actor? Well, well it's like a kind of a transmigration of spirit, in a sense. Uh, to, that's from our our uh, our pal Milch. Yeah, yeah. I guess it is. Yeah. How would you decide whether you were doing black and white or color? Oh my God! Um, I just remember it was low light and fast action, and everything was blurry. So I kept trying to get higher. Is it ASA, honey? <laughs> Thank you, honey. Um, so I remember going up even to a thousand or whatever, but um, usually it was color, wasn't it? I took mostly color, I think. 
Um, There's a lot of black and white. I mean, would you just... I just mixed it up. And the black and whites I could develop myself at school. So That's yeah. interesting because the black and white... Okay, we'll get to the baby stuff. But what's interesting about... I mean, because you're, your black and whites are really, to me, um, capture the emotion without the distraction of the the color of what what we were like without the peacock and the the that uh the transcendental rage mm -hmm. comes through without the um i mean the i don't know it's just very interesting so i just wondered was that the difference, was just whether it was available for a school or taking yeah, it? Yeah, I don't remember making any choices there. Um, I was just thinking, this might not be related, I don't know, but I was thinking how, with the book, younger people seem to be responding to, like, they can recognize that the people in the pictures are living authentic lives. They're not performing them for social media. You know, they're, and so, and I feel like they really, and maybe it's after COVID or I don't know what it is, but I think they are thirsting for connection, you know? Yeah, and we talked about how there are these scenes going on and we don't know about them because in oppressive regimes in China and Iran and other places where if you post anything, you risk annihilation. And when you see these photos of shows no one is there worrying about people documenting it i mean it was it was an anomaly to have someone with a camera and i remember being so hungry to see the documentation to catch a video to catch any of this and it was all just about the pure thrust of um what was going on and and What's interesting is the role of women. Let's discuss that in the scene. Again, I I feel like uh, in the in the absence of change, in the absence of knowing any different, you do the you recreate the same kind of uh, what you know patterns. It's very hard to change, and it seems in the scene the hierarchies and the rules seem to be replicated in many ways. With the outer world, like yeah, male-dominated. Like, correct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yet Elaborate. there were those bands. There were, I, I mean, if I had been courageous enough, I would have done it, you know, so. But it, but it was, I mean, I didn't, I didn't hear those bands played on the radio. They weren't yeah. given the recordings. Yeah. I, I mean, I mean, they weren't, uh, to me, there were gatekeepers, and there were girl gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. And uh, girls could be the bass player, maybe? Mm -hmm. I played bass. <laughs> it was easier, I thought. You could be a bass player? Because, yeah, there's all those strings on the guitar. <laughs> yeah, bass player, oh. I got a bass, too, a Fender black and white precision, but it was fucking hard, because that was what al was allowed. A bass player... You can take pictures. Take pictures. Mm -hmm. You ca You could be do a fanzine. You could do b journalism, which a lot of people started their career that way. But you look at those pictures of the shows. Or you could also have a baby. <laughs> and a lot of people. Who? What are? Who are we looking at? Um, this is Madonna, not that Madonna, obviously. Um, and her son, Eamon. Yeah, they were, I, I actually was in a band with her at one point. Um, not that we played out, but um, yeah, that's them. And yep, these are my friends. At that baby shower, the flyer was up there before. Oh, wow. Yeah. And this is mental abuse. I developed that one, mm -hmm. see? No, it's not mental abuse. It's um, ultra violence. I think they were oh. opening for mental abuse. Yeah. That's Harley. I'll tell you a Harley story. Harley, how many people are f familiar with Harley Flanagan and Cro-Max? Or <laughs> so uh, Harley was in. Harley was 13, 12 years old when he was in this band called the Stimulators, and he was 
hanging out. It was a very early punk band. This is pre New York City hardcore. This was like punk New York Dolls. Max is Max Kansas is Kansas City. City yeah. Yeah. yeah, and he was hanging out with like um, <clears throat> Wendy Warhol, and they went to Ireland, and he came back, and I'm trying to remember what year this was. It was probably seventy nine eighty. And he came back, and he was a Brit-style Brit skinhead. And I ran into him, and, I, and he had the ox, the, he had, he had uh, Doc Martens and the shaved head, which this was not the style. The suspenders, all of it, the braces. And he was like, this is what it's all about. This is what it's all about. And I remember thinking, you are crazy. This will never catch it. And he was skateboarding. And... And it's and he he was right. I mean, it did. It was embraced. It was this kind of street fighter style, but it morphed into like the New York City version, which was sweatpants because nobody could afford that outfit. But there was very strict structure of what you listened to, what you wore, and what you what you how you conformed, what the uniform was, all of that. Some girls could kind of there was more leeway for that yeah i feel like that happened after a while right like w if we felt like freaks in our hometown and we look different than everybody there then all of a sudden we're here and we're all starting to conform to you know this look how did you manage that like where did you change your look when you went home you asked me to think about what it felt like in my body <laughs> mm -hmm. back then and i just remember i didn't look below here wow if I looked in a mirror, I just did not look b below there. And I often just wore, you know, I had good legs. So <laughs> I would just wear, you know, whatever, just a big thing covering all that. And what, what did your parents say? They were busy. Um, my dad did have a good line when I shaved my head. He said, uh, I mean, it's going to sound horrible now, but it is funny. <laughs> um, well, if you're going to act like an asshole, you might as well look like one. <laughs> That's fucked up, bro. I know, but it's a pretty good line. I mean, you know, I have kids. I get that. All right, all right tell, you got to tell the licked story. The which story? The licked story. The what? Oh, unlicked cubs? Yes. Oh, but that's, you that's just acting. Like that's a, but, but okay, that's okay, right. fine. I was just saying last night that um, every time I... and there was some character explaining like that a mama bear had seven baby bears and she was just gave birth to them and she was licking them clean, licking them clean and then she died before she got to the last bear and that bear went right into show business. Because <laughs> um, I'm always looking at, around for the unlicked cubs, you know, whether they're behind the camera or in front, you, always in front of the camera, always. How many people here are unlicked cubs? I'm not going to raise their hands. <laughs> Fucking cowards. Or healthy. Um, but, well, well, that's the thing. I mean, for me, it, it was, I couldn't show up to clubs. It took a really long time to be able to feel safe to show up. Um, I felt like if I didn't have the uniform, if I wasn't thin enough, I would not show up because nothing was worse than being a fat girl. I didn't feel that way towards other people, but I couldn't imagine anyone looking at me and saying I was enough and I was okay, that I could, that I could belong to what I really wanted to belong to. So it's pretty amazing that you had that camera to give you that uh, permission to enter into that other world. I mean, that in, to me is what acting kind of is. It gives you permission to let go of yourself and be someone else yeah. and just give yourself over to something else and not think about your body. Yeah. You know? Lose it. Yeah. yeah. Did other kids and your, and one thing I, I remember feeling so in love with the identity of punk that it gave me the superpower that I knew I was right and Sorry, I said that with kind of an uptick, kind of a, um, I knew I was right. And I knew that the girls that were into Duran Duran were stupid. And that 
if they teased me, that just gave me fuel. That it, it gave me this protective, energized bubble that I really didn't care. Um, did, did that, did you feel like that? Yeah, but you know, there's a, I mean, there's someone in the book named Lazar and I, she just scared the hell out of me. And so she had, to, I had to be friends with her because otherwise, <laughs> you know, the, it was that or, yeah. And I just remember being with her and uh, all of a sudden being in a fight because you had to, you know, take her back or whatever, you were part of her group. And she would make these poor girls from New Jersey and Connecticut and not far from where I was from, um, take off their boots and go home in their socks. And she'd give them away. Um, I'm not sure, wait, what were you saying? Just that kind of. Yeah, that's it. Uh, that, <laughs> well, we were talking about the people in, uh, that weren't in the scene and that once you were accepted and in there, how. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it's getting past those gatekeepers, and there were, like, for me... Um, Should have just had a camera. Yeah, I know, fuck. Or a station wagon, because then you can drive the bands around. <laughs> you have to have a purpose. I mean, I did. I was, like, I talked to them at on the phone. I would call. They would call me after and tell me about the battles and what they would the, what they were doing. Um, and they would tell me about what was really going on at home and how many of us were getting locked up. I mean, you have to remember that, I don't know if you guys know about uh, Quincy Jones, Quincy, no, Quincy Jones, Quincy, what was it, MD? It was, uh, who, what was the actor's name? Quincy, Quincy M.E., what, what was the actor's name? Klugman. Jack Klugman. Jack the TV show is the first one of the first times that punk was portrayed, and it's a hardcore show. And someone is well, punk show, and somebody is killed with a fucking ice pick. It's you got to watch it on YouTube. Wow. It is the most hilarious thing. They have a a Donna a, a Donna Donahue type scenario. Yeah, we we all went on Donahue. Oh God! <laughs> it it was like you have Klugman at the end, kind of going like this is terrible, this leads to, you know, kids, this leads to death, mayhem, and murder, you know, you, you gotta lock up your kids before this happens, and it was terrible, because people listened to it, and they did lock up their kids. I just rewatched that movie, um, Times Square. Did anyone, see, do you guys remember that? It was 1980, it's, it, it's kind of great, it held up. Um, but they meet because their parents locked them up, the rich kid and the poor kid, and then they break out together. But it was a thing, I remember. Uh, you reminded me of it, yeah. Yeah, people had um, really good insurance. Where are we on time? Okay. And <clears throat> um, there was really good insurance, and hospitals would take kids. Why? It was enough to say, you know, they're, they've got a mohawk, and they're not going to school, and they're... Why would anybody uh, sing this shit, listen to this shit? And it's funny, because I thought it was the most beautiful music ever. To me, it was like... Because well, it was honest. Well, well, also, I appreciated the music. I appreciated the, the harmonies. I appreciated the, the, the melodies. And uh, it, it didn't feel... Oh, wow, look at that. <laughs> That's Harley. Is that not trauma? <laughs> He's just starting to talk about it now. And he is a lot, actually. He's, there's a movie coming out, and it's all about... Uh, because after, after it all, he ended up on the street, right? And um, it, it was as bad as it could get. A um, lot of surgeries, and he now runs a dojo, right? No, no oh, he's a... It's, what is it? Um, not a dojo, but... It's not Taekwondo, it's the other one. Mo 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 no... There you go, jujitsu. Thank you. Oh God. <laughs> um, and see again, isn't that like physical and intimate and dangerous? Yeah. I don't oh know. wait, wait. Yeah. Okay, the, we're going to talk about Alexa. Look at that. Look at her eyes. Now that she's what I wanted to look like. I think we all did. 
She was so great. She's still around. That's Alexa, my roommate. I, I, we just all hung out in New York and same eyes. Yeah. And so, so. But see, and she came from a totally crazy family, and yet she was out there dancing with all the guys. She was, and she was really sexual and really, and I just thought, oh my God, she's so free. Look at her. But I guess there's a difference between free and throwing yourself in front of a train. Uh, I think there's not being licked and then being just kicked. Yeah. Now, th this, this is interesting to me because you're, you're going to see a lot. What, what, what struck me is when I looked at the galley of Brooke's book, was there a lot of girls that start showing up with babies. That's another way girls were allowed to participate. Well, she was also the lead singer of Nausea. And she's got a baby. Yep, she does. Because it's like that was not... A, ba a guy could dream of fame. I mean, there was the idea that maybe some bands would break through. They were touring, they were starting to make money, and a girl will, uh, at the end of the day, what's your power is having a baby, you got a lot of attention for showing up with a little punk doing the next uh, generation. And there is Jimmy in the front there. Uh, in his famous uh, Three Stooges shorts. And a germ shirt that, that I made those uh, mental hospital again. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll get to this, but I wanna go back to the baby thing, because let me skip ahead to find where we're going to... All right, their baby. Where, let me get baby. Oh, there, baby, Alexa. Okay. This, this is really important for me to talk about. Because you see this going on where when you have no family, when you feel you have no family, when you feel you have no place to call home, a lot of times... Um, even though your economic situation is fucked, you feel, let me bring another, let me make a baby. Let me bring a child that things will be, I will lick this baby. I will create a better world. And also it's the attention that you're gonna get. And especially now without the access to abortion in many places, um, this is intense for me because this is Alexa who was out there just out there in the pit in the middle doing fearless. And she makes the decision because you talked to her about this, about the wisdom of it, um, to, to bring a baby into there's no place to live and, and have another punk in the scene. And I... I I came very, very close to this. I um, had a skinhead gang. My partner was a, a skinhead. It was like a, a kind of a ska skinhead gang, <laughs> gang, um, uptown West Side Skins. And I was also in foster care. And this was my idea, to, this was my camera. I would be able to have this baby in front of me, like you wore your camera, and it wouldn't matter that I was fat. I told people that I wasn't fat, I was pregnant. And then I worked to get pregnant. <laughs> I wasn't even pregnant yet. And I wanted nothing more than to have a little punk baby. I was looking for a baby Doc Martens. We would fight over whether the baby would listen to Metallica or not because he liked Metallica and I didn't. <laughs> Is your friend here? <laughs> so uh, uh, you couldn't find baby dogs. We had little braces. And I was in foster care. I was in a group home. And I really thought that this would be, I imagine nothing more than being here at CBGB's and having this family. And... After some intensive, uh, intense near violence, I realized that was not the path that I was meant to go down. 
And I'm very grateful that I decided not to do that. Um, after that, for me, the scene, the the need to participate, the need for like feeling that this was everything, that this was life, mm -hmm. that this was the only way to express it, it kind of evaporated. Mm. And you had something. At what point for you? I mean, sorry to be such a bummer, but um, again, more trauma. My uh, brother died when I was 18, just in a surfing accident. Uh, and it was very, uh, you know, unexpected. And I just remember not long after just thinking, oh, I, I need to grow up now. And like, you know, this, it was, j it just felt done, like you said. Yeah. What do you, I mean, it's interesting that for both of us, it was this kind of loss and this world that was all encompassing. It just, it's kind of like, watching water go down a drain, it was like all of a sudden, you know, that idea of the matrix of, a, of it just kind of seeing past something, this, it just kind of fell away. And, and it's interesting in the sense for some people it never did, <laughs> you know, that they're still very much in it. And I, I envy that in a way. I mean, it's, it's different, it's a different reality or, but what do you think, what are your thoughts of, of why? Of why it fell away for me? Yeah. I mean, it just, my brother was a very positive, light person, and I was not. And actually, when I think of myself, I don't really remember my, I think it, it's two people, me before he died and me after. And uh, I just thought I should try to be more like him, you know? Uh, I just felt lucky to be alive and, you know, I needed to do something with my life. So that was it. And what was the thing that... Acting. <laughs> yeah. I just, I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts and, um, you know, started working as an actor, yeah. And then I went into the other pit. <laughs> and, you know, Silence of the Lambs. All right. Um, it's funny because you're good at getting out of a hole. I'm good at getting into holes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, I mean, in, in a way, you kind of went to the most terrifying place. It, it, it sort of, it remind, I went to, I remember thinking, what's the most scary thing I could do? And in, uh, like, in the late 80s, I, I went to piercing school because that seemed like, you know, something that I wouldn't... Piercing school? Yeah, I went to Fakir's piercing school. Wow. I, I have a certificate that I'm a piercer. I've pierced tongues. Do you have to get that updated? <laughs> <laughs> Probably, but I haven't. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I've pierced a tongue. It's, it's like going through liver. But, but the thing is, it's like you you did... That to me was like, what is the most unlike me type of thing, a scary thing? And you did a very scary thing. I mean, you grew up. Can you talk f quickly about... Aren't we over? We're like babbling away over here, no? What, what time are we at? No, we have a little bit before. Yes, what? we are. What, what? Tell you what. Tell you what. Yeah? What do you want me to tell you? Oh, wow. I'm getting <laughs> there, huh, Brooke? <laughs> I like this. Um... Well, your, your, your parents, your mother, mm -hmm. but what was her reaction when you left the scene? Did, was she aware of that, that you like left the hardcore scene and then you went into... She just saw that I was, you know, starting to go to school and trying to, yeah. Did she like that? Yeah, I think she did. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like you were forged in the pit. And after surviving this, I mean, we both know how fucked up the acting world is and the rejection. And it seems like, um, did, did it help steal you for what you were going to face? Gosh, I don't know. I don't know. 
I think it was more that thing, like I said, of the the separation, and I just felt like I was getting closer to being on the stage, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so putting aside the camera. Yeah. Yeah. Taking pictures now is weird. Because if I go to a show now, you know, it's like all phones in the audience. And I just think, what a bummer. You know? Like, I just want, I, I force myself to not take pictures. I'm like, just be in the moment. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's, why is it so hard? Well, yeah, I mean, it was a very, it, it's such a different, absolutely. Now, now it's about, curating a self and being showing that you're a part of something as opposed to a way to uh, transport uh, a permission to join something, right? Mm -hmm. To be in something that nobody is documenting and nobody was offering a hand in, but you had the uh, homing device, like recognizes like, and if you don't have the outfit or feel like how we felt not okay in our bodies, our bodies, if you wore the outfit, someone would spot you. Like I would see a skinhead and be like, okay, I don't look like you, but I am like you, a punk. So if I couldn't, because of my body size, wear that clothes, um, but you recognize that other being, it was the way you found your family. Mm -hmm. And now it's it's you you just post it and it's i post it therefore i am you you control that it's not you don't need to get past any you can create it you can pretend you're part of something i mean and it's funny cuz for a long time I, it took forever to make this book obviously um and for a long time i didn't feel like i could because it's not me you know what I mean? Like I felt like I had to go find everyone and be like, is it okay if I put this book out? It just felt very personal. You know, very like, I don't know, why would I show that to anybody? Does the act of having put it out, I mean, big thing of the punk scene was you didn't have to ask for permission and you got permission and you've gotten a claim for putting this out. Does it make it easier to not ask for permission or need permission? Yeah, I mean, we all just got to get on with it, don't we? I don't know. I mean, we, we don't have that much time. <laughs> so we might as well just do what we want to do. Okay, last question for you. The, the, so your character in Silence of the Lambs, it's so much about the body. Mm -hmm. Plus, I had lost all the weight. Oh, being a vegetarian. <laughs> and then they were like, okay, you have to gain 20 pounds. And I also was supposed to be totally naked. And I was like, guys, I'm a single 21 year old. Like, really? Um, yeah, it did a number on me, gaining the weight. As you can imagine. Yeah. Um, yeah. But also, the pit itself did a number on me and got me in touch with a lot of stuff because I just remember being in there and thinking I would give up. <laughs> wow. And I had to look at that. But yeah, you, uh, and it's interesting. Do you know what I mean? Like the character did not. She was like, she. how did she, she thought of the bone and tie it to and, the thing and, the and get the, I was like, I would just give up and be on the, I'd just be a sobbing fetal <laughs> position, you know? And then I thought, why wouldn't I fight for myself? But, but, but you also didn't go in the pit. You were on. The, you found a creative, clever way to say, with the camera, you were on the side. You weren't in the pit. That's what it was called, the audience. Yeah, yeah. It's the pit. So she wasn't in the pit. You were safe. You found a way to be safely on the side, documenting the pit. So it's kind of like a, um, <clears throat> what is a disassociation in a sense of not, there's another self in the pit. And, I mean, the future self is in the pit. I'm getting all fucking out <laughs> there. <laughs> Just be original. <laughs> exactly. Let's look at a couple more, and then we'll open it up. Right. This is, this is, oh, God. Hang on. We got more? Oops. Gingy's interesting. That guy there, Gingy. He's um, the son 
Which the, one is like all, all, One of the very few people of color on the scene. He was the lead singer of um, Absolution? No, God, I'm going to get it wrong, and all you guys in Zoom land are going to hate me. Um, there are worse things in life. I guess. Uh, anyway, his dad was Marion Brown, the jazz oh. musician. And he came from the Bronx, and, you know, that whole scene up there was, and graffiti, and... This was in a squat. Krishna, the guy on the right, lives there. Uh, that's Buzz. Jimmy. <laughs> Jimmy Gestapo. We don't call him that now. <laughs> this is Jimmy, I have letters from Jimmy Gestapo wanting to bust me out from the mental hospital, didn't understand it was an open unit I could leave any fucking time. <laughs> That'd be as fun. Yeah, and we ran into uh, Ross from the Cavity Creeps and Murphy's Law again. Letters, phone calls. Just tell me, I'll come get you. Why the fuck are you there? It's because I knew I couldn't survive on the street. There's, there's Alexa. And my mom's Subaru. Subaru. <laughs> yeah, a lot of these people are gone. She's gone. A and that's the thing with when. You gather, it's it's talking about who didn't make it, and so many people didn't. If there was no, I was lucky that I had, I had a family that my mother did fight for me, and I, I a lot of it was luck, getting a social worker, landing in a, a group home that worked for me. But if you didn't have that and didn't have a, a net, there... I mean, it reminds me, I think things might be worse now. Um, what are the rites of passage for people now? That's what I wonder. Who is that, Brooke? That, yeah, I thought I might as well throw that in. Uh, that's me, yeah. No, again, in my mom's Subaru. On the Palisades Parkway. Oh, now, what did you... What did you think of yourself? Because to, to me, you, you are just so tender and beautiful. I mean, this is kind of huge. I don't think I've ever shown this photo publicly to anybody because, You're you know. You're here. But look at I was okay. You were okay. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Back then, I didn't, I didn't think so. What did you think? I just didn't want anyone near me, and I was just completely, at the same time, numb and totally full of pain. Were you saying that to anyone? No. I mean, because to me, you look so, what, the way you described yourself before was so painful, and I don't see any of that. But it, You it, don't? No. Oh, because that's kind no, of the, the photo No, the negative, the negative, what you said before about oh. how much you thought about yourself. Oh. But do, is that, does that change for you seeing it now? I mean, can you offer her that compassion? Can you lick her? <laughs> Well, yeah, and how wild. Then you grow up, right, and have your own kids and think about, you know, I mean, I have a kid that age right now. And she's wonderful. And she's She doesn't fucking. look like that. What, way, 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 what, but what would, the, what do you mean? She's a, it would be beautiful if she, she'd be. I don't know, probably, does everyone go through it, even people who are not, I mean, is it just part of life? It is, yeah? Someone said, yeah, see? <laughs> I, I I mean, it seems like it's possible to, that's why I like to take pictures no matter what, If even if I say, oh my God, I look terrible, because I know looking back, I'll say, wow, look how young I looked. Yeah, we all have that. I just, so this is, this is the book, Sunday Matinee, and we're now going to open it up, and thank you for uh, sitting here for, for our conversation. And <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Brooke. Okay, we'll take a few questions if you want to raise your hand. Uh, thanks. What's your name, please? Oh, my name is Lorraine Olson. Hi, Lorraine. Uh, I'm really a big fangirl of you, Brooke. So, um, uh, so I got the book and I was looking at, I looked at all the photos and, and considering what Laura said about the women who opted uh, for motherhood, because I opted out, and I'm of an age, but I'm, I'm, I was really struck by those photographs of those women with those children, and if you could sort of encapsulate those, 
who those women were to you? I mean, I, I'm still, I still know them. And, um, you know, it was all love. I'm sorry, but it was. They were, they were in love with, I mean, both people, all three actually. So it's um, Alexa and Tommy, just totally in love. And, you know, I said, guys, maybe you shouldn't have a baby. I don't know. You know, but it's like, and she's fantastic. I mean, she's a grown person now. Um, so all of them, same, Madonna and Fran and, and Eamon, they were totally in love. And, and same with um, uh, Amy and Roger. So it was, uh, I don't know, I don't know. You know, who's to say? What did it bring up for you? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Fuck the rules, <laughs> just talk. <laughs> Like I said, as somebody who opted out of parenthood consciously because I had a sister, whatever, she had four kids, two were home births, I was there for one of them and fainted, and my mother turned to me and said, well, I guess we're done with grandkids, and I said, yeah, so, so but, but I love children. I currently am caretaking a seven and ten-year-old, uh, my great nephews, so I'm, I'm at the age of 62, kind of oddly into kids, but those pictures really struck me. I mean, they're beaming, you know, and that's, I didn't expect to find that in this book. Yeah. You know what I mean? They're really beautiful little surprises. I kind of found them delightful. Oh, that's so, good. I'm glad. Uh, but yeah, delight is what it brought up for me. And I didn't, you know, I wasn't expecting that in a book about hardcore New York City punk scene. There was so much love. I mean, it, it was that I, you, it was creating family and falling in love. And even to this day, I really feel like if I was in trouble and called Jimmy, he'd be there. You know? Like, we have each other's backs in a way that... But I guess, like I said, it must be for other people in other worlds, right? Well, I think when you go through traumas is like a very intense clue. When people who you've gone through a traumatic event... Um, do you want to pick... Nobody else has a question. Oh, your hands up. okay. Wait, the mic. Hello. Hi. I was wondering if you had any. Oh, sorry. What's your name, please? I'm Sarah. Sarah. Nice to meet you. Hi. <laughs> I was wondering if you had any thoughts or feelings or responses to the Riot Girl movement in the '90s. The Riot Girl movement. Right. A lot of it was kind of a response to hardcore and like the exclusion of yeah, women. Yeah. What were the year? When did it start exactly? Like the early '90s to mid '90s. And can you say some of the band names? Well, the most famous is probably Bikini Kill. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was not familiar with that scene. But, well, so. I mean, I mean, they they went to jail. I mean, they are really they're activists, um, and it's it's uh, carrying on that spirit. It's women not being limited, and I think that you've continued to see women disregarding. I'm going to use the P word, patriarchy. You know, and and just doing it the way they need to without asking for fucking permission, you know, and, and going to jail for it in some cases. And it's incredibly powerful and inspiring for uh, legions of women and uh, girls who, um, uh, people of all ways of identifying to start bands and be out there. And it's, it's, it's incredible. And, and all shapes and sizes. I mean, now I see people that don't have to wear a uniform and wear a mini skirt and a certain outfit or be a certain gender and look a certain way. That you can be any fucking way, identify any fucking way you fucking want. Nobody has the right to say what pronoun you use. If somebody rolls their eyes, that's their fucking issue. And that's what we've seen change and it's fucking great. But yes, yeah, some people are definitely going to jail for it and will still get killed for it. Does that answer? <laughs> Thank you for your question. Okay, next, please. We, we have a question from Zoom. There were more black people in the photos than expected. How far did inclusivity go? I mean, I knew, I knew quite a few people who were um, also, I mean, Roger was, is Cuban. Yeah. Um, I, had my friend I knew some Asian people, I knew some black people, I knew, <laughs> I mean, but it was, yeah, I don't know. Was it different in other towns, I wonder? Because it, it was New York, so. Well, New York was a real, was, this scene was a real, real melting pot. And it wasn't until later that 
you, you had these wars with, the, this gets into the minutia shit of like maximum rock and roll, which uh, Tim Yohannan was wonderful and brilliant. And he would talk about the violence in the New York hardcore scene, which then attracted more violence and saying, so these kids basically walking around calling themselves names that were meant to provoke really had no ideological, you can't hold them to their, there was no ideological priors on these people because it was just like, whatever will piss you off, I'm going to do it and say it. And um, people were spouting off. I remember singing along with bands that I had no idea what the fuck, you know how to, the way you'll have a kid singing, I pledge allegiance to a friend, and I just said that. it was like that. And it was like just saying this shit. Um, and people who you came from, I, I was Jewish, and I, I, and people were of color. And, and how about the bad brains and how they were the best of all of them? You know, that was always so and cool Still to playing, me. yeah. So that was one thing that was very unique about the New York City hardcore scene. It was a real, real melting pot in it. It, it wasn't until later when people would come in and provoke. When you, it, let's blame it on Steve Bannon. <laughs> <laughs> he was back there, wasn't he? Stern shit? Uh, yeah. I know you know. Okay. Another question, please? Uh, the... Hi, I'm I'm Blue. Hi, Lou. You're Lou. Um, blue. 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 Hi. Hi, Blue. <laughs> Hi. Hi, UFO. Um, <laughs> um, I was wondering. So, you know, we look back at that time, and now we know what a special time that was for punk music. When in that moment, when you were taking photos, did you get a sense that you were documenting like music history or a part of music history, or was it really more um, those were your friends and who you were around at the time? and you were just taking pictures of what was going on around you? Or did you kind of know that in the future you'd have something really special documented in music history? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't think I thought about the future at all. But I did think this was the coolest thing. So I was going to take pictures of it, you know? Um, yeah, I don't think I thought about that. And it's funny, I was just saying today, like, if you took these pictures out 20 years ago, I'd feel like people would be like, oh, yeah, that's nice, whatever. I don't know, why is it so, why does it mean so much now? Is it because we're all like whatever age we are? Well, I mean, I think it, 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 you spoke to that before. First of all, it was a time when people didn't have iPhones. It happened, kids were creating these shows. A lot of kids were, it wasn't with adults involved a lot, or they were very young. And it did, to answer that part of the question, it did feel very exciting. It did feel like this is everything, you know? Yeah, and you could die. I mean, literally, it's like it felt like uh, it was very... But it also didn't feel about we were going to get famous and make money either. It no, didn't feel it was, that it, either. It, the end-all, be-all was just... It was just of the moment. But you had them in, the shoe bo in a box. Not a shoe box, but yeah, a box. Yeah. And I was moving, and a friend saw them and was like, can I show these to a curator? And I was like, ooh, ooh a curator. <laughs> yeah. And so then I had a show, and then it took forever. And, you know, the pandemic, I finally just said, all right, I got to do something in this house. But I also think it, it you really did capture, you, you so disappeared and were so through that lens and capturing this kinetic energy. And that's one thing about the scene. It was a very kinetic based on moving, constantly moving, because literally people, to stay still, risked uh, inner reflection, and nobody wanted to do that. And so if you were going to be still, you were going to get high and fucked up because you didn't want to sit still. And so much of it, it was this energy. And you really, there's so much motion going on. Like, if you look in the book, you'll see background stuff of people and, and expressions. And that's very special to that time. And nobody's like posing and thinking, I'm going to be an influencer. You know, it's, it's very interesting. Um, for some reason, I just remembered that someone in this book um, who now lives in a commune in Oregon used to, uh, called Farmageddon, shout out to Farmageddon, Neil, um, 
I think he was in the Animal Liberation Front, and they used to break into labs and like lead bunnies free and stuff. I don't know why I just thought of that. I thought I'd throw that out there. It's a good one. I mean, any people could do anything. Uh, in other great houses, up here in the front. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> There's one in the back, then one more on Zoom. What's your Hi name, there. please? Uh, my name is George Santos. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you win, you win the award uh, for that. No, I'm Nicole. Uh, I was very struck to hear both of you say that your engagement with the scene came to an end after you had each experienced an extreme loss. And initially, the scene is energized by rage because so many of the people involved had suffered physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, as you were saying, and yet the abuse was never acknowledged, never spoken of. So the grief that should have articulated itself at the abuse was buried. And when you both suffered a loss later on, the grief came out. And once the grief came out, the rage was dissipated. Yeah. And the engagement with the scene came to an end. Does, does that make sense? Does that sound plausible Completely. to and you? Completely, and going to shows, um, I used to feel like the mute, like, like I always had noise in my head, and I'd go to the show, and it would do that. It would relieve some of that, you know, noise. Um, wow, that's very cool what you just said. But it was getting in touch with grief yeah. that enabled the the rage to come to an end, and, and took out the energy that engaged you in the scene. And you know, my family never dealt with my brother's death either. Really? No, they just didn't. Mm. So. I, I didn't go back there, but I did leave this place, you know, that was my family, so that's interesting. Yes. Um, yeah. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, it, it hits that sore spot where I want to cry, so I know it's, it's definitely, how could I sing about, like, you're not crazy institutional sticking, I'm the one who's crazy, in, you know, when it's just like, yeah, that's like finally... You're in touch with that grief. I saw a pretty cool documentary the other day, you guys, about this uh, Life of Agony. You guys know that band? It was after me. You should find it. It's uh, Netflix or Amazon or something, and it's it's unbelievable. You got to see it. I won't say what it is then. But what what triggered? I mean, it? just the fact that this lead singer of this band, as they got to their like peak and they were going to become huge, quit, and no one knew why. And then it was because he was trans. And now they're on tour, and it, uh, she it, is singing. So what what year did they stop? Um, I mean, they started 90, so I was already out. And uh, I don't know when they stopped, and now they're on tour, like I said. So, uh, and his, and the story, I mean, it's just amazing to see him back then, and uh, his family was, I mean, that trauma stuff is real. Did you think it wasn't? No, well, <laughs> maybe. Yeah, well, that's a, or a not lie. universal, but I guess everyone has trauma. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's just a matter of degree, I guess. And uh, I think we have time for one more. Hey, UFO. Oh, can we do two? Okay. Hey, um, I'm Allie. Hi, Allie. Hi, Allie. <laughs> Hi, y'all. Um, kind of like a little bit like what that last question was about. I um. I want to thank you guys for having a talk about hardcore punk rock that like talks about it as the like drama therapy that it that it sort of is, especially from like a female perspective. I appreciate you both. Um, I wonder thank like you. I wonder like uh, for you like when did you, um, I guess you're saying like when your brother died or like it, you know like these things happened that made you when did you really like fully come full circle with it and realize that that like rite of passage that you were going through with your body with your trauma and stuff like had uh like can you talk more about that like like how long did it take till yeah, I could yeah, see like, it all clearly like, are you still in it I was gonna like, say like <laughs> 10 minutes ago I don't know it's it's I guess everyone does this, right? I've, I'm only alive this one time as far as I know. But um, like when you get to this age, right? You start looking back and things make sense. It's And we kind of knew then too, didn't we? Damn it. That's what I mean by like we should just get on with it. Um, can you answer that question? I, I 
No. <laughs> I'm writing, you know, and often I, when I write, I mean, I, I created a, a whole other being to find out what, how I felt and asbestos gloves to handle material I couldn't. You know, that was my camera, you know. So Do you feel like you have that too? Yeah, like an ongoing thing. I, punk rocker, as a kid, I, I, I'm like an outreach case manager, which oh, I wow. feel like is like another form of like trying to hurt yourself a little bit. Wait, so being an outreach worker feels like it, it's... When you, yeah, yeah, kind of. Like if you've um, been part of that life and then you're trying to be of service, but in a fucked up world it yeah it feels kind of like a um it's masochistic um in a way that's kind of like uh that reminds me of of i don't know my time doing well, well sometimes it, it is <laughs> like going back in time and trying to reach a self that um <clears throat> needs help and and as if you're going back you, you know to it you're reaching to help a self that didn't get that and what I would suggest to you is that you never know when you are going to the effect of your being present with someone will actually make a difference and you might not see it then that that need to be of service to yourself it might be feeling like a selfish reason um that obviously is is a is everything we do is complex um, that really could save someone's life, and sometimes you might not know, you might not ever find out, but you might have someone show up and say, "Hey, you saved my life." So thank you for doing that. As someone who I've had people in my life who gave that, and c I couldn't say anything to them, they they saved my life. You know, and, and I made art that I know has saved people's lives, you know, so. Um, next question. <laughs> Hi, my name's Denise. Hi, Denise. Hi, Denise. Hello. Um, I guess, Brooke, to speak on your point about, like, why do people care about the photos now? Um, in a way, it's kind of taking a look to the past. I'm of a younger generation, so it's a, a time that I don't know about. And it's kind of seeing in their faces the same pain that people have today. And it's very validating. It can seem like a bit cyclical, where it's you can be in this moment that looks so familiar, but it's not your time. And then to see how people grow out of it, it's a bit inspirational and also just validating to see like these struggles everybody goes through no matter what time period it is in. So I guess to kind of speak to your question of why it's so interesting. Um, but That's my, great. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. My question for you guys is, when you're going through talking about this time period of, of, of what you guys went through, do you look at it now from like a bird's eye view of seeing, I guess, what, what emotions come up most? Is it pain for your old self that had to go through this trauma? Or is it compassion? Is it regret, remorse? Just curious on what comes up and if it's new every time or the same kind of emotions? God. <laughs> um, wow. I just thought of so many things at once. There's a guy in the book named Carl. And uh, when I was in New York recently, I was sitting in the old A7, which was this club we were always at, um, signing pictures of my old friend who's no longer here. And I just started crying because I just thought I can just see us across the street, you know? And if someone came up to me, you know, like 40 years ago and said, hey, one day you'll be across the street signing pictures of this guy. And, you know, um, yeah, I, I thought of something else too, but I'm trying to remember what it was. Um, I don't know. Do you have anything? It's, it's, it's moments of being, you know, it's hard to plug in to get past like um, the bullshit and then just find that raw place where you live within it and connect to that really, that it's a scared bunch of people cr trying to create a community, a family, and so many didn't get out alive. And, um, and go back and have like the way, um, 
Ali is doing outreach. It's almost like you look back at these pictures and seeing, for me, like there are people, how did I fail them? How did I fail, fail myself? And, and letting go of that. And um, the, the drive to like, you know, get on with it. It's like what our mentor would say, do the next indicated thing. Because sometimes it's so hard to get off that hamster wheel of like the regret, the mourning, the this, the that. It's important to grieve and to acknowledge it. And that, I think, is the impulse in art. And in a way, when you create art, it, in a sense, you kind of give it away. And you, you let go of it, and you create a, a common uh, uh, story that other people can recognize themselves within and becomes larger than, um, it, it's a giving birth. It's, it, and it's, it's the right time. Like for me, it was knowing that was not the right time for me to welcome a baby. Eventually it was. And I think that's, that's the continue of storytelling, which you're doing as well in, in the writing written form. I also look at them and I just feel like so thankful to that world. Because I really do feel like it saved me, you know? Um, so it, I feel like, you know, yeah, I, I want to honor it, you know? Like it's a love letter to that time, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah, it definitely is. I, I, I mean, I think that's the importance that people can create community and find it. UFO, you have a question? You do not break the rule. What about this? Is, this will be our last one. But what about these poor kids now? I'm just thinking of my kid and how she just went through this COVID and was on the friggin' Zoom school. And how do you create community? I can see them really. But struggling. well, it's not. I mean, they're doing it. They, you know, they. And we. I think our job is to give them the time and the space to acknowledge that they went through something really fucked up and not. It's our fears of okay, there's economic factors, and you want them to go to school and take advantage of this and that, but also to recognize that they need to find, g have their time out. Yeah. And and we, it's not our job to find them their scene or their way of expression. They will let us know. UFO. Yes. What's um, your name? Edwin. Hi. Uh, Wait, what's your name? Ed. Ed. Hi, Ed. Yeah. Why is she calling you UFO? Well, I make music, so. Oh, okay. I, I discovered very, myself in that well, realm. Well <laughs> I don't get out much, sorry. It's okay. Um, being a photographer um, and in the environment that you were in, did you ever meet resistance taking photos without anyone knowing? And like, it, it seemed like you seem to know everybody. So you're like pretty much family. But um, I know um, she's a photographer and there'll be days where I'm like, it's so difficult to get photos randomly because everyone will be like, don't take my photo or the flash. Like how, how, if you did meet resistance, how did you handle it? You know, I would never take a picture of anyone that I felt, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I, I definitely, it took years cause I've made documentaries and stuff and I had to learn to just like keep shooting, keep shooting, you know, like, um, <sighs> Gosh, I'm just losing my mind again. Um, wait, so. No, but I remember sitting in front of CB's and when people would drive by to take our picture, we'd be like, five bucks, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah, totally. So I think I wouldn't have tried to take pictures. I just would have been too nervous. I would have been, I wouldn't want that reaction. Yeah. There's a picture, that, uh, the Village Voice used to do that. They would come and take pictures of the kids outside CBGB's and I, I dressed my sister. I was a stylist, I, you know, with the badges and everything and she was one of the featured one and Deanne Arbus's kid was doing it, mm. uh, Dune, I think. Is that, is it? And uh, uh, they got shit. They, it was dangerous for the Village Voice people to come around. Um, do you think it helped that you were female taking the pictures? My gut was yes, <laughs> when you just uh, asked that. But I, I don't know why. Well, it's like the mama with the baby. Yeah. It's kind of cradling. Think of the weight. Of, it was a big Minolta. Yeah. 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 Baby. baby. Uh, well, All right. If you'd like Brooke to sign her baby, um, and I will be signing my babies. <laughs> and um, just want to thank you all for 
coming and thank the library and thank yeah. you everyone. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Anissa. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. This, this is a very, very special place and I'm glad we're able to gather here. And um, anything else you want to add? No, just thanks, guys. Yeah. Thank you.